I am really excited to kick off a brand new series. You just saw a little video. The title of the series is Stand. Someone say that. Stand. Say it like you're awake. Come on. Stand. Do I got to remind you that I preach way better and quicker when you respond? Stand. Stand. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a good day. Just kidding. Good to have you here today in the presence of Almighty God. I'm so grateful that my wife and I get to pastor this amazing, amazing church. What, has, what God has done in the last 21 years is nothing but miraculous. I am blown away, honestly, every Sunday that I get up here and preach. I, this is crazy. Like, I'm like, why do they keep coming back? And I know it's not because of me. It's because of the presence of God in this place. But thank you for serving and volunteering. And you guys that give financially, we're making a difference. Uh, like my wife said, 15 people in Haiti giving their life away. Uh, we got to serve our community yesterday. And so all the, the finances that you give, we steward it uh, effectively and with integrity. And uh, we're not living in mansions and driving nice cars. We're investing it back into the kingdom of God. So thank you for all that you do to make new life such a wonderful place. I want to applaud each and everybody in this room. And why don't we put our hands together and thank God for those on our right and left, those in front of us. Amen. All right, Daniel chapter 1. It's in the Old Testament. It's right near the book of Ezekiel. Five-week series. Title of the series is? Come on, you just saw the video. What is it? Stan. And we're going to look at uh, Daniel chapter 1 today, Daniel chapter 3 next week, Daniel chapter 5, and then 6 and 10. Here's what I want from you. I want you to be here every single Sunday. I want you to make it a priority to be here every Sunday. And uh, I want you to also invite someone next week to come. How, how many of you came to our church and you received Jesus just because somebody invited you to come? Let me see your hand. Come on, raise your hand and look around. Look at all these people that eternity was changed for these people just because of an invitation. So don't take that lightly. You got friends and co-workers and family members uh, that are pagans and need Jesus, invite them to come. So I want you to be here every week, and I also want you to invite someone. By the way, you know who the best inviters are? New Christians. People that have been saved a long time, they're just like, yeah. So I want to talk to all my newbies. Where's the newbies at? And uh, invite some people. Let's, let's get some people in our city saved and one to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? All right, title of the message today is Stand Out. Someone say Stand Out. How many want to stand out for Jesus, like in the, in the right way, not in the wrong way? There are too many weird Christians in our church. They don't go to the fourth service. They go to the first three, and they are, the word I'm thinking of is creepy. Do you, do you know, I'm not, I'm just kidding. There, do you know any creepy Christians? Nobody? I remember one time I got a flat tire on the way to church, and this creepy Christian lady, she's like, you just need to take authority over that demonic tire spirit. I'm like, no, I just... It wasn't a demonic tire spirit. It was just I ran over a nail. Like, you're weird. Um, one, one week I was preaching on the blood of Jesus Christ, and the lady said, this has got to be God. She said, she woke me up, and God woke me up, not she, God woke me up in the middle of the night and told me to wear a red dress. It's not a coincidence that you're preaching about the blood, and I wore a red dress. I'm like. <laughs> My friend uh, Lance Ralston would love to have you at Calvary Chapel. So, God, I'm just, I didn't say, I didn't say that I thought about it, though. I, you know how many know what I'm talking about? Like weird Christians, people in our church are like, Pastor, you, I, I take our invite cards and I bring them to the collection and, and I'm just thinking like they're really weird. I'm like, don't do that. Don't tell them that you go to New Life. Tell them you go to the Presbyterian Church or something. You are, the word that I'm thinking is you're weird. You're creepy. I don't want to stand out in the wrong way. I want to stand out in the right way. Anybody else? Come on, stand out in the right way, not in the wrong way. Have you ever talked to somebody and it's just, you're in the middle of a, hey, how you doing? They're like, good. And See the Dodger game? Yeah, we won last night. And Kershaw didn't really pit. Why take authority over it. just like, oh, we're praying right now? That was weird. Like, we're just talking about Dodgers and now you're praying. That's really weird. And uh, hey, I can't find my keys. Anybody see my key? It's okay. It's okay. You don't have your keys. We got the keys to the kingdom, brother. You're like, you're, you are weird. You're, you know what I'm talking about? People like that? I'm so thirsty. That's okay. Thirsty for the Lord. Thirsty for the Lord. Okay, whatever. I want to stand out in the right way, like, like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Dan, Daniel, right? Like in the right way, standing for God. Can I tell you where we're going to go this afternoon? I just want to lay out my, my three principles. Number one, it's going to be fun. We're going to laugh a little bit. It'll be a great time. Number two, point number two, it's going to get intense in here. Is that okay? 
Like, you're going to be like, I, I, I should have left after the first point because it's, I'm going to get in your face. I'm going to challenge you because how I many know God's word challenges us? Do you know one day I'm going to have to stand before Jesus? I'm going to have to give an account for how I led this church. And if I just get up here every week and say, you're awesome, you're awesome, you don't need to change, you don't, you're perfect, stay like you are, then I mean, that's not true. We're all wanting to be conformed and formed into the image of Jesus Christ. I hope that this year you're further along with Jesus than you were a year ago and five years ago. It's sad to me. People have been going to our church five years, and you're no further along spiritually than when you were five years ago, ten years ago. There, there are people, they've been saved six months, and they're further along than you. See, it doesn't really matter how long you've been saved. It, it, it matters how how, how, how you're progressing in your walk with Jesus Christ. So I just want to preach the whole counsel of God. And we're going to talk today about how to stand out the right way. Someone say the right way. Anybody watch the news? You read the newspaper? Are you discovering that the culture, the, the world that we live in is pretty intense and antagonistic, even violent toward the things of God? Do you know in, in France, the government just came out in France and said, if you're an evangelical church like we are, in France that you are on par with a satanic cult. They're basically saying a church like ours and witches and Wicca is pretty much the same thing. Uh, there, there was a, a missionary from the United States, I just read about this, he went to India and him and his wife gave their life away and their son and they were working in a leper colony trying to minister to, to uh, leprosy uh, people that are dealing with that condition and one guy didn't like it and poured gasoline on him and his son and lit him on fire just because they stood up for Jesus Christ. I mean, this is coming to a city near you and I. See, I'm looking at a, a great family here on the front row, and they're, they're about my age, maybe a little bit older. I don't want to get in trouble, but I remember, I remember when, do you remember Leave it to Beaver? Remember that show? And actually, they would show the, the mother and the, the husband and the wife sleeping in separate beds. They're married, but they're sleeping in separate beds. And uh, we've gone from Leave it to Beaver and the Brady Bunch to like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. Is that the name? I don't, I don't watch that to Will and Grace, to, we used to see like in the 60s and 70s on television, a husband and a wife in a bed together. Now we see two guys in a bed together, two gals in a bed together, two guys and a girl. And once you start redefining marriage and family, anything goes. So if it's okay to have two wives or two husbands, why, why isn't it okay to, to marry your dog? Why, why, honestly, they're having this conversation right now in our culture. Why is it wrong? Why is it wrong to marry your daughter or marry your son? If we start redefining what God orchestrated and designed, see, for me to even say that, you're like, that would never happen. We said that about same-sex marriage 20 years ago. And I mean, you know, the culture that we live in has become violent toward the things of God. We pulled God out of the halls of justice. The Ten Commandments aren't there. We're not allowed to pray in school anymore. We don't do the Pledge of Allegiance anymore. And I mean, you know, that the culture and the morals and the values are waning each and every day that goes by. But where are the Daniels of New Life Community Church that will stand up in the middle of the culture and say, you know what, regardless of what happens to the culture, I want to live my life for Jesus Christ. I'm already preaching right now. I haven't even read the text. And sometimes, I don't know if you're like me, sometimes I wonder, like, God, why do you, why do you put us in this environment? Why do you... Why couldn't we live in the 40s or the 50s or 60s? At least being a Christian back then, we weren't frowned upon or looked down upon. Why, why is it getting so difficult and so dark? And, and, and what is our assignment in the middle of this environment? I'm glad that you asked. I have a verse for you before we read Daniel chapter 1. Look at this. Philippians chapter 2 verse 15 says that you and I as Christians are to live clean, innocent lives as children of God. Why are we here in the middle of a perverse, dark generation? So that we will shine like what? Bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. That's why I have you here, New Life, for service. Hey, and it's going to get darker and more wicked and more perverse, but I've left you here in this county, in Southern California, in 2018. Look into my eyes so you can shine bright at your school, so you can shine bright in your neighborhood, shine bright in the workplace, so we can be different than the world. Live clear, clean, innocent lives in the midst of a dark generation. Anybody a candidate? That's what I want to do. So for the five of us that lifted our hand, I'm on board for that. So Lord, help us do that in the name of Jesus. Bless your word as it goes forth. In the powerful name of Christ, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. all right, I want to pull out three principles out of Daniel chapter one. I got to turn my Bible around because it's upside down. 
Three things. Number one, write this down in your notes. Point number one, God's purposes. You're going to love this, God's purposes. How many know that God has purposes for you and plans? Jeremiah 29, 11, God knows the plans he has for you, declares the Lord, plans to give you a future and a hope. God's purposes or plans are seen in every circumstance. Every, not some circumstances, not part of your life, most of your life, the majority of your life. God's purposes and plans for your life are found in every single circumstance. Check this out. Daniel chapter 1, you ready to read? Verse 1 through 5. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of uh, Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to, to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, everyone say that. So if you're pregnant, I'm thinking that'd be an awesome name for your kid. <laughs> Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. So Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is going to pluck out four boys from Jewish culture, and he's going to indoctrinate them, and he's going to make them eat certain foods and drink certain things. Uh, what are the characteristics? Verse 4, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians, so he's going to reshape them. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. Let me just stop right there. Jewish culture would tell us that you were only able to eat certain foods and drink certain things. The king of Babylon said, no, 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 we're going to indoctrinate you. We're going to make you eat these kinds of food, and we're going to make you drink this kind of drink. So that's what happened. They were to be trained for how long? Three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Notice the names here, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them, what did they give them? By the way, do you know that the culture is trying to rename us? Young people, they're trying to rename you. They're trying to tame you. Check it out. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Meshach, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Let me just break that down. I want you to look at the screen here. Notice that the Hebrews had a name, and then uh, Nebuchadnezzar changed their name. So to Daniel, the name Daniel in the Hebrew means God is my judge. They said, no, we're not going to call you that anymore. We're going to call you Lady Protect the King. And all of God's people said, what? Let's try that again. All of God's people said, so, no, my name is God is my judge. No, it, lady protected the king. Let me also add this. Do you know that one of the way the enemy attacks, and he's doing it recently, is he's trying to confuse our young people with their gender. So it doesn't matter that maybe biologically you're a boy. If you feel like you're a girl, you're a girl. Isn't that interesting? And so the king of Babylon said, no, we're changing your name from that to that's weird. Hananiah, God has been gracious to I am fearful of God. And that's what the enemy wants to do is to get our focus off the fact that God is a good God and us to be afraid of God. Azariah, God has helped me to this servant of Nebuchadnezzar. Mishael, literally, nobody is like our God, Meshach, I am despised. And he, so the enemy is trying to change our name and to tame us. But listen, it doesn't matter what the enemy tries to do. Even though we pulled God out of the schools, the Ten Commandments out of the halls of justice. I mean, no, you might prevent me from praying out loud in a school, but I can pray silently in my heart. It doesn't matter what you try to do. That's why the Bible says God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. But power, love, and a sound mind. Hey, it doesn't matter how dark the culture is going to get. I'm not afraid. I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loved me. It doesn't matter how dark the world's going to get. I'm going to continue to stand up and not bow down to the culture. So I wrote this in my notes. When culture shifts, shifts, you better know who you are. You better know who you are. Because I'm telling you, it's going to get worse. And it's going to get, until Jesus Christ comes back or we have national revival, turn to somebody and say, it's going to get worse. It's going to get darker. It's going to get more crooked. It's going to become more perverse. But God's looking for a Daniel spirit that will stand up in the middle of the culture and say, you know what? I'm not afraid. You could kill me. It doesn't matter. You can kill me. Guess what? I'm going to heaven. I love the apostle Paul. They're, they came to him and said, hey, hey, we're going to kill you. He's like, bring it on. I'm going to heaven then. He's like, oh, forget, forget it. We're not going to kill you. We're going to let you live. He's like, awesome. To live as Christ. They're like, mm. 
okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to let you live, but we're going to make you suffer. He said, bring it on, homeboy. The sufferings of this world can't be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. You kill me, I'm going to heaven. I stay here, I glorify Christ. If you make me suffer, God's going to get all the glory. And I came to church this afternoon to let you know, regardless of what's going on in your life, listen, God is good 100% of the time. And there's a tendency for us to think when things aren't going good that God doesn't care about me. Where, where is God? I want you to know this, that my wife and our family, is, that we're not any different than you. Maybe better looking, but aside from, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're not any different. I want you to know that just because I stand on the stage and I have a title of pastor doesn't mean anything. This, this might shock you. Once in a while, my wife and I disagree and argue. Thank you. Let's try that again, okay? I'm going to get it like a response, like you're so shocked. Sometimes, ready? Sometimes my wife and I disagree and argue. And 99% of the time it's her fault, but sometimes our kids give us attitudes like your kids do. They're getting better because they're getting older right now. And sometimes it's like spiritually I'm on a high. I can't wait to get to church. It's awesome. I love it. Sometimes the alarm clock goes off on Sunday morning. I'm like, oh, I wish I could sleep in. I wish I could just go to the 1230 service. <laughs> I just like, that's how I feel. Well, you should be like, always what? No, I don't always feel like that. I don't wake up every morning like, hallelujah, I get to read my Bible. No, I don't feel like that. A lot of the time it's not a feeling, it's a discipline. And I got to tell you, sometimes we have highs, sometimes we have lows. Sometimes spiritually or emotionally or physically, I'm on a mountaintop. Other times I'm in the valley. But here's what I've discovered serving God for 33 years. God is faithful in the high and the low, in the mountaintop and in the valley. Listen, his purposes and plan will be discovered Every area of our life, all the time, God is amazing. God is good 100% of the time. Can somebody make some noise? So I, I wrote this down in my notes. God is working whether I see it, believe it, feel it, comprehend it. God is working. And he's in control and he's sovereign. And I got to be reminded of that because when I received Christ, I had some offers to play college basketball. Now, when I say that, I don't want to be like the pastor that says, yeah, uh, I was going to play at UCLA or Kentucky or Duke. No, it wasn't that. It was Biola, West Montezuma. Don't be a fan. I mean, it's just smaller schools. So I had full, full, full rides to go to those schools. And I went to my pastor. I said, I'm really confused. I know I'm, I want to be a pastor. And he says, if you know you're going to be a pastor, I would go to a Bible college. And so I gave up all these scholarships and I went to Bible college. And I found myself between my freshman and sophomore year I was working two part-time jobs in the summer trying to raise, save money for tuition and food. And listen carefully, I wasn't playing video games. I was working two part-time jobs. But even working those two part-time jobs didn't get me enough money to pay my bills and tuition. And so I remember one summer in between my freshman and sophomore year, I ran out of money. I had like $4 in my pocket. I had no food. I went down to the grocery store and I bought a loaf of bread and some turkey meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for seven days. I was like, this stinks. This is horrible. I don't like turkey sandwiches. I didn't even have enough money for mustard and mayonnaise. And I tell you to say that, listen, there was a time in the dorm room I thought to myself, Steve, you made a big mistake. You should have taken the, listen, not only would you get a free education, they would pay, you would be able to eat in the cafeteria for free. Here you are at Bible college. I think God's forsaken you. I mean, it's in those difficult, dark times where you press into the person of God and God says, no, I got you, Steve, I got you. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't walk in fear. I got you covered. And he provided my need. And I'm telling you, this is the story of my life. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Sometimes things are going well, sometimes things aren't going well. Do you know, I, uh, I've told some people in our church this, before my wife and I had our three kids, do you know we had three miscarriages? We, we were pregnant three months to the day. I can still, I can tell you, I was on my way to church. We were youth pastors and my wife miscarried three months to the day. At the same time, there was a girl in our youth group, probably 14 or 15 years old, one night stand. She goes out after a football game, sleeps with a guy and gets pregnant. Here we are trying to do it the right way, married, in ministry. God, how can this be? We're trying to do it the right way. We have a miscarriage. This girl goes out on a one night stand and has a, she gets pregnant. And it was in those times, not only did we have one miscarriage, we had two, three miscarriages altogether, but it was in those times that we had to set aside time at lunch and read verses and fast and pray and depend on God. And I'm telling you, as dark as that time was, God always shows himself faithful in the good times and the bad times. I don't think it's a coincidence that we had three miscarriages and now we have three kids. God's like, I got you. And I believe when we get to heaven one day, we're going to have six kids. And we won't have to feed them all. It's going to be awesome. 
I'm just telling you God's faithful all of the time. Check out this verse, Romans 8, 28, and we know, we know. I want you to let that set in. We know, not we think, we hope, we might. We know all things, what? Work together for good to those who love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. Listen, 100% of the time, in the good times and the bad times, God is working good in your life. See, we only think that he's working in the good times when everything works out. No, no, even in the difficult times, even in the painful situations, God is going to take all that stuff, work it for your good and for his glory. Would somebody make some noise in this place? God's purposes are seen in every circumstance, every situation, all of the time. The first time I was telling the other services, the first time I preached internationally, we were going to do a week-long pastor seminar in the Philippines. I was kind of freaking out because it was the first time I would have to use a translator. So I was on the airplane, and we were flying over with a guy who had been on many international trips, and I said, hey, I need some, I'm like freaking out right now, I need some advice. Like, how, how do you use an interpreter and a translator? And he said, well, you just got to make sure you just say a couple words and then stop. And then let them say a couple things. Now, when they're done, you say a couple things. And it's kind of back and forth. And I said, well, how do you know if you have a good one? He said, well, you, you know you have a good translator if they're passionate. If they mimic you, if they mock you. If they're, so when you, you say something, you stick out your hand and then they say, and you know you got a good one. I said, how do you know if you have a bad one? They said, you know you have a bad one when you say a couple words and they just like. <laughs> they say a bunch of stuff that you're not saying. So I say. Good afternoon, everybody. And then he's like, he's like, then you know you got a bad one. In other words, he's saying stuff that you've never said. You need to find another one. Check it out. I came to church today on October, whatever the date is, October, to let you know some of you need to fire your interpreter. You've been listening to a voice in your spirit. Maybe it's your own voice. Maybe it's the voice of parents that have spoken over your life. Maybe it's the voice of the enemy. You know the Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy? He is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, I sat in Bible college thinking to myself, you know what, I, I could never be a pastor because I was, I was never fit for this. It was a lying voice. Some of you need to stop hearing voices from other people, voices of the enemy, your own voice that tells you because of your past, God can never use you. It's a lie. It's unbiblical. It's unhelpful. It's ungodly. Today is the day to fire your interpreter. I give you permission to do that in the name of Jesus. They're saying things that is inconsistent with the word of God. God is good 100% of the time. He's a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I, do we believe that or is it just like a song that we sing? No, he's a good, good father. Even when I lose my job, he's a good, good father. Even when I get a bad diagnosis, he's still a good, good father. Hey, look at the story of Lazarus. The Bible says that they came to Jesus and they're like, hey, uh, he's really sick, he's going to die. And he's like, oh, he'll be fine. He stayed, the Bible says he stayed in the place where he was. What? It's like one of your best friends. Leave and go pray for that guy. No, he stayed, and the Bible says that Lazarus died. So Jesus shows up later. They're like, hey, where were you, man? And what happened? He prayed for Lazarus, raised him from the dead. So what's the greater miracle? The greater miracle is that he raised somebody from the dead. It would have been awesome if he would have came on time, prayed for him, and he got healed. That would be great. But a greater miracle is God got greater glory because he raised a dead person alive. I mean, God's so in control, so sovereign. And when we think that he's forsaken us, he hasn't forsaken us. He's always working together for the good. Amen. Let me amen myself. Amen, Pastor Steve. That's good. <laughs> All right, point number two. Ready? Remember I told you it's going to be intense? Remember I warned you? Here we go. Point number two. God's people... Refuse to compromise. God's people refuse to compromise. Write that down. People compromise. How many were here last Sunday? I wasn't. Where were you? We went to uh, Elevation Church in North Carolina. Do you know about Elevation? So we just sang two of their songs today. Here again, Echo. We sing a lot. Oh, come to the altar. I can go on and on. It's an amazing church. In 10 years, there are 25,000 people. So we went to learn. We went to a couple of their services. We went to a two-day conference. It was amazing. And so check this out. We flew in Saturday, got there Saturday night. I was starving. We missed lunch, except that cheesy little box meal they give you on the airplane. And we were like starving. We checked into the hotel. We, no, actually, we went right to the restaurant. It was a barbecue restaurant that I took my son to a few months earlier. And uh, it's called Midwood Barbecue in Charlotte. You need, to, you need to Google. It's amazing. 
It's like wood wrench. Uh, so it was, it was amazing. So we were so hungry, and so the wait, waiter comes out. Hey, uh, do you want an appetizer? Yes, yes. What would you like? And we're like, see that that f- here are French fries, smothered in pimento cheese. But that wasn't the best part. And then they they slice up beef brisket and throw it on top. I'm like, <laughs> sounds so good right now. 125. I haven't eaten all day long. So it, it was amazing. And then we we got pulled pork and ribs and hush puppies and collard greens and it was amazing. So then we're all done, we're just like all full. You want dessert? Uh, let me pray about it. Yes, I do. Uh, and so we got, ban- <laughs> we got banana pudding and we got like four or five desserts and seriously we're just like, we walk out, we're just like, oh. then the next day we went to a couple services, had a big lunch and then Sunday, so now it's like Sunday night at eight and we're like, we ate too much at lunch, let's not eat, let's just go to Cracker Barrel for some dessert. We get to Cracker Barrel, they pass out the menus, and we're like, no. I think I'll order a chicken fried steak. <laughs> so we got chicken fried chicken, and would you like gravy on that? I'm like, yeah, is the Pope Catholic? Of course I want gravy. <laughs> uh, yes, I do. And two orders of mashed potatoes, and so we did that on, on Sunday night, and then we had more dessert. And how many... How many of you have ever, like, you're so full on Sunday, you're like, seriously, God? <laughs> you're, like, praying in the middle of the night, just like, God, you and Prilosec, if you get me through this night, I promise you. This is the joke in our house, too, by the way. Monday, we're going to eat good on Monday. So, like, I woke up on Monday, I'm like, forget, dude, I had felt horrible. I couldn't sleep, and, and uh, so I'm like, Monday. And I ate pretty good. Like, Monday, I had some oatmeal, and then... We went to lunch and stuff, and I picked a couple French fries, not too bad for lunch. And then Monday night, somebody got something, and I was picking off their plate, a couple of this, a couple of that. And, and by the end of the day on Monday, I was like, dude, I made a commitment to wake up on Monday not to eat bad, and here I am again. And then Tuesday came around, and we ate really bad, and we went to the barbecue place again Tuesday night, more French fries. And, and then after that, we went to like a Bass Pro shop, and somebody said, let's go get some ice cream. And I walked in, I'm like, I'm not eating ice cream. And I found myself in the line. I'm like, <laughs> can I help you? And I was like, don't do it, don't do it. Um, and I saw there's these little, like, kid size, small, medium, and large ice cream. She's like, you want something? I'm like, uh, no, yes, I do. Uh, what size? I'll take the medium one, please. What are you doing, Steve? And then, do you want anything inside? It was kind of like, uh, you know, Dairy Queen Blizzard. Do you want anything? Of course I do. I want Reese Peanut Butter Cup. And so then we woke up Wednesday, jumped on an airplane. Our son picked us up. I'm like, dude, you made a promise you would eat good on Monday. And then I'm like, forget it. So we're driving home. I'm like, I'm just going to have a salad. And next thing is the car pulled into in and out and... <laughs> Man, like, I already blew it. I'm just going to have a couple of hamburgers and some fries. So, what I decided today is that tomorrow on Monday, I'm going to start eating again. <laughs> That's some of our spiritual lives. It's like, I'll, I'll cheat a little bit this day and cheat a little bit that day. And before you know it, man, you're in and out burger and... I was thinking about Jeffrey Dahmer. Remember that guy? Like, ser- think about this. The guy, he got to a place where not only did he kill people, he ate them. Here's the question. How, how do you get to that? Do you, do you wake up one day going, I think I'm going to eat someone today? No. <laughs> and so they started to peel back the curtain a little bit and discovered he, he started watching pornography and then that wasn't enough. And then it was crazy stuff. And sadomasochism stuff, and that wasn't enough. Just, and then he started slitting people's throats, and then he started killing people, then he started eating people. I'm not surprised by anything anymore. People, Pastor, if you're not going to leave so-and-so, they just got a divorce. I'm like, oh, no, I know, I know, I know, I know about him. I'm, that doesn't shock me at all. It might shock you. I can tell you, this has been going, this didn't, you don't wake up divorce. It's a series of bad decisions along the way. You don't wake up 17 years old and pregnant. I just, Pregnant? No, no. It was a bunch of bad decisions along the way. And check it out. So Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, you're going to eat this. You're going to drink this. Verse 8. Check out what verse 8 says. It shouts this principle. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and the wine. Check it out. I looked up that word resolve. Uh, In the New King James, it says he purposed. The New Living says he determined. The Good News says he made up his mind. 
If I were to tell you 20 years ago, let's just say we're like in 2000 or late 1990s. If I were to tell you in the late 1990s, in 2018, a teacher in North Carolina would get written up and reprimanded because she called her students boys and girls, you'd be like, what are you talking about? No, a lady, a teacher in North Carolina got written up and reprimanded and said, if you do it one more time, call your students boys and girls, you're going to get fired. For what? Because you can't say that he's a boy. You don't know that for sure. You're not sure that she's a girl. You got to call them friends. If I were to tell you that 20 years ago, you're like, dude, you're crazy. If I would have told you 20 years ago, there's going to be shows on television called Sister Wives. One guy married to five people and you'd be like, no, that's crazy. Because I'm used to like Brady Bunch. No. If I were to tell you that in most of the bathrooms all over California, they're going to be dual gender. So think about this. We live in a culture now, if you're a 40-year-old man, but you identify as a woman, you can go in a locker room, at a, a girl's locker room in high school. What? So what? The, if I would have told you 20 years, you're like, there's no way that would happen. So what, what's coming next? Once you redefine gender, once you redefine marriage, once you redefine the family, anything goes. Why can't one guy be married to three girls and a dog? Or why can't, no, I'm, I'm serious. Because there's legislation being written right now. If a father loves his daughter, why can't you marry your daughter? Why can't a, a mom marry her son? If, if anything, I mean, if you can be married to a man, married to a man, a gal, married, like anything goes then. We just, everything, right? And notice this, Daniel purposed in his heart, I will not do this. I've told you this, my, my family, has, we've never had a conversation on, on the weekend. Hey, what do you guys want to do on Sunday morning? We have already made a decision. We've pre-decided we are going to be at church unless we're sick or out of town every Sunday. You're like, well, you should. You're the pastor. We would make that decision if we weren't. Because I know it's good to be in the house of the Lord. I need it. You need it. So we don't talk about it. We don't pray about it. Do you know, my, my three kids are going to be at probably three, or f- three of the four services. Not because we made them. They, they want to be here. They're here every single Wednesday night. Not be, well, yeah, actually, we do make them come on Wednesday night. You're like, well, that's not fair. They're like early 20s. They should be able to make their, well, they can do that. If they want to get their own apartment and live on their own, they can make their own call. It's for me and my house. No, we're going to church. We're not praying about it. We've already decided as a family, we will serve God. You got to pre-decide something. If you're, if you're dating someone, can I just be really honest with you? This just stays in here. That's why I don't really prefer like having little kids in the service. I prefer that they would be in the classrooms, but I just want to be real. I, before I received Christ, I lost my virginity at 17. And for a couple of years, I would sleep around with my girlfriend. I got radically saved in October of 1985. I went home. We didn't have cell phones. I went home and I'm like, um, we're breaking up. I got saved. She's all, saved from what? <laughs> that was it. Hasta luego. I've never seen her since then. It's over. It's over. And so when I I got saved at the age of 19, I made a decision. I pre-decided I will not sleep with another woman until my wedding night. So from the age of 19 until 24, five years, by God's grace, he allowed that to take place. But I had to make some decisions. Because I, I lived in an apartment with a bunch of guys. She lived in an apartment with a bunch of girls. And we would say, I'm not going to go to your apartment unless one of your friends is there. And you're not going to come to my apartment unless one of my friends are here. It's too late in the back of the car when you're kissing and making out. And it, you're in the middle of a park at 1230. You think you have enough composure to say, well, we got to stop right. It's going to be too late. you got to pre-decide. We will do this. We will not do this. Can I talk about dating for a second? I got a lot of adults in our church. Hey, I just, I got a question on my, my 14-year-old girl. She, she met this guy at youth group, and she thinks he's really cute. He loves the Lord. What do you think? Don't do it. Is your 13-year-old going to get married at 13? No, but, okay, then, then why do that? Just wait till they are old enough, 9, 20, 21, 25, 30, whatever it is. Because all the kids are like, get me out of this service right now. Like, I just don't think it's a good idea. You're setting yourself up for failure. Daniel resolved, he pre-decided, I will do this, I will not do this. Check it out, as I read the Bible, God is number one in every area of our life. Can, let me ask you, can you kind of be a Christian? Like, are you a doctor? Kind of. Are you a teacher? Sort of. Are you married? 
I think so. You cannot, according to the Bible, kind of be a Christian. You can't come to church for 75 minutes on Sunday. Let me back up. 60 minutes on Sunday, because most of you are 15 minutes late. <laughs> Jab! Jab! That's why I got to have Pastor Andrew speak every once in a while because he is so nice. <laughs> I jab and he's like, oh, you're awesome. Anyhow, uh, you can't come to church for 75 minutes a week and kind of be a Christian. You're either all in or all out. Daniel resolved, predecided, I will not do this, I will do this. Check it out. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, Romans 12, 2. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Philip says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. So I got two of my favorite drinks up here. <clears throat> Straight espresso. Where's my espresso drinkers? Come on, raise your hand right here. <sighs> this is so bad. Pray for me. I've already had, before the first service, I had eight shots. And <laughs> relax. He tried preaching to you four times. <laughs> so... So this is one of my favorite. I can drink espresso straight. I love it. Come on, raise your hand if you, you like espresso. And keep your hand up. And I want you to look around at all the real Christians in our church right now. <laughs> These are them right now. So, so I, lo I love me a little espresso. And I've just been recently turned on. I don't know, last couple of months, I love LaCroix. How many like LaCroix? So check this out. It's kind of my morning drink. This is like mid-morning afternoon drink. So this is going to represent Jesus. This is going to represent compromise. So how many of us, we wake up in the morning? I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Sorry, I'm losing my voice, four services. I just love the Lord. Then church is over. Get on the freeway, somebody cuts you off. You blankety blank son of a dad. Oh, oh, I thought, I thought we were just singing, I love you, Lord. I know, now we're cussing somebody out. Oh, I just, man, I love the word of God. It's so powerful. Every morning I wake up and get my eyes on the word. That's all. Daniel resolved not to defile himself. I just love looking at the Word of God. Then later at night, everybody's asleep. There I am behind the computer. Going to websites that I shouldn't be going to. I got a little Jesus, but nobody knows about a little bit of my compromise. Remember I told you it was going to get tough in here. Not only do I get my Bible out, but man, I got my journal. I'm, it's awesome. God speaking some stuff, writing it all down. And, oh, it's so good. And then, then you get to work and you send off an email to somebody, a text to somebody, give them a piece of your mind, cuss them out. So you just, you just wrote down, God is showing me da 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 da. But then, you blankety blank, Mike, I'll never forgive you. You dang ding ding ding. Send. <laughs> He's a good, good father. It's who you are. Who you are. Then the same hands you just lifted up, praise to God. Now you're touching your girlfriend in places you should not touch her. Here's the problem. People in our church are just like, well, like, I got like mostly God. I just got like a, a little bit of, the, just a little bit of the world. So like Sunday I live for him and Monday I live for him and Wednesday and Thursday, but like Friday, that, that's like my night to go out and party a little bit and, and nobody kind of knows. That's like what, just my night. And so we, we tried to mix a little of Jesus. <laughs> this is a lot of our lives. Jesus on Sunday. Compromise on Monday. Jesus, we'll come to first one. Oh, it was so powerful. First one I came forward. It was awesome. Thursday, I cuss people out. I give them a piece of my mind. I touch people that I shouldn't die. And we're constantly living our life like this. And I'm telling you, the problem with that, Jesus said, I am light. And in me, there is no 
darkness at all. I'm not saying that we're not going to fail. I'm not going to say that we're not going to sin. We all sin, right? A righteous man or woman falls seven times, but we rise again. But we, listen, you don't make a decision. I'm just going to, you cannot be kind of a Christian. I just don't see that in the Bible anywhere. We have to make decisions today. Tomorrow when I wake, I, I got to do this. Tomorrow when I wake up, I have to read my Bible. Because if I don't read my Bible, then Tuesday I get lazy Wednesday. Before you know it, like I'm like, <sighs> by like Friday, I'm like, what happened to Pat? He's like, psycho. I know. It was like Peter, remember? When Jesus was going to the cross, the Bible says Peter followed Jesus at a distance. And the, the further you get away from Jesus, you start acting crazy. So I can't afford, I, gotta, I have to decide, I gotta read my Bible every day. It's just good for me. It's good for my attitude. I gotta pray all the time. It's good for me. I can't do that. I will not, I will not meet a female anywhere. I don't counsel females. If I have, if Pastor Crystal or somebody on our staff that's a female meets me in my office, door wide open 100% of the time. I will not have coffee, go to a restaurant, ride in a car with somebody that's not my wife or my daughters. Well, it just seems kind of prude. No, I just, I, I, know, I don't want to set myself up. Because I am spirit, we're also flesh. And the flesh wants to do what the flesh wants to do. I love this. Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself. And if you want to live for Jesus Christ, you and I have to purpose in our hearts as well. All right, so I wrote up a couple scenarios. Ready? Areas of compromise potentially in 2018 at New Life Community Church. Here we go. Number one, your boss calls you into the office, and it's a very long story, but the bottom line is you have to lie about another coworker, and if you'll lie about that other coworker, the boss won't be fired, and, you're, and you won't be fired, and he promises to, quote, take care of you if you lie. So what are you going to do? Make a choice. Take a stand. Number two, you're out to dinner with some friends, and they suggest that you see a late-night movie together. You hear the title of the movie, the content, and the rating, and you know for a fact that it's going to make you very uncomfortable. But these are good friends. Why make a big scene? So what are you going to do? Make a choice. Take a stand. Number three, young people. Where's my young people at? Oh, good. We have three of them in the service. That's awesome. <laughs> young people, you're at a football game Friday night. When the game is over, a few of the kids say, hey, we're going to Tyler's house. His parents are gone for the weekend. Some, some of the girls are coming over. We've got a keg of beer and some weed. You coming? <laughs> you coming? No, I'm not going to come. Thanks for the invitation anyhow. Number five, you're in the break room with a few coworkers, and one of them responds to the question about faith with, quote, all religions are basically the same. As long as you're sincere, it doesn't matter what you believe. So what are you going to say? Make a choice. Take a stand. Finally, you're a married man. Where's my married men at? Is that Kevin? It's awesome. That's what I was hoping everybody would do. I'll give you another run up. Where's the married men at? Excellent. So you're a married man and a, co a female co-worker asks you to go to the lunch, just the two of you, strictly to talk business. It seems innocent. She's a really sweet person. So what will you do? So I guess the question I'm asking you is, are you a thermometer Christian? Do you rise and fall with the pressure around you, or are you a thermostat? You set the spiritual temperature. God's people refuse to compromise. I don't know if you know this. We're, we're trying to build a church of radical, sold-out, committed followers. Not people that don't make mistakes. In fact, if you're perfect, you're no longer invited to our church because you're going to mess us up. But I'm saying, like, totally, radically, all in, fully committed to Jesus. So this is, I guess I should have called this sermon Operation Crowd Reduction. This is how to shrink your church in one easy sermon. Here it is, just one point. We refuse to compromise. It doesn't matter what the culture's doing. It doesn't matter what our friends are doing. Check it out. It doesn't matter what other Christians are doing. They're not my standard. Jesus is my standard. All right, ready for some good news? Point number three, God's people. Number three, God's, God's provision comes to the committed. God's provision comes to the committed. So, hey, man, what, what happens if I do take a stand for Christ? What if I refuse to compromise? Then what, Pastor Steve? Well, then I got good news for you. Verse 9. Now, God has caused the official to show favor and compassion on Daniel. Why? Because he didn't compromise. You want favor? You want compassion on your life? Refuse to compromise and God will take care of you. 
Now, that was way better, uh, way better preaching than you responded. Verse 10, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid my, my Lord the king who has assigned you food and drink, why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official has appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servant for how long? How long? Do you know the, the, the number 10 in the Bible has to do with testing? Someone say testing. I'll prove it to you. How many commandments in the book of Exodus? 10. How many plagues on Pharaoh? Huh? Ten. You know, Malachi, Jesus says, I want, I want to test you in the area of your finances. I want you to see it. I want to see in your life if I really am God. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to give what percentage back to me? That's a tithe, ten percent. The disciples were in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. You know how many days? There's a theme here. How many days? How many, how many days did they walk around the walls of Jericho? Six. I just wanted to see if you're paying attention. <laughs> ten, 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 ten. So for ten days they tested Daniel. And check this out. Verse 14. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days they looked healthier and better. See, so when you refuse to compromise, you're going to look healthier and better than the people around you. Let me just say, I don't have time to finish the rest of the chapter. You can read it later. So for 19 years of my life, I lived my life in the world. I pretty much did everything that the world said, if you want to have a fulfilled life, do. Party, did it, been there. Sleep around with girls. I thought, man, maybe it's like, I got to just be the best basketball player I can be and I could find my satisfaction in sports and trophies and accolades and championships. And, and that came and went. So for 19 years, I pretty much did everything the world said do, and I kept discovering that I still had a void in my life. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ in the last 30-something years have been amazing. Do you know, I, I was never on an airplane for the first 19 years of my life. Couldn't afford it, never had the opportunity, gave my heart to Christ. I can't even, I, I've traveled all over the world preaching the gospel. Just went to Spain like two or three weeks ago. And a friend upgraded me to business class. Went to Africa, went to Indonesia. I've been all over the world. Opportunities have opened up to me that never opened my first 19 years. Who would have, I mean, are you as shocked as I am that I got to marry my wife? How many are blown away by that? Yeah, and I'm shocked that your wife married you too. I, gotta, I didn't deserve that. My wife's amazing. My kids are amazing. Our church is amazing. I'm just saying not 10 times better serving God. I'm saying 100 times better. I'm talking 1,000 times better. You can't even compare it. I have joy that I never had before. I have peace today that I never had before. Listen, we have an amazing church. We're uh, growing. We're influencing our city. I never had that before. Who forget about all the accolades. How many more stories do we need to read about, about celebrities making millions of dollars, taking their life, hopeless, uh, have no joy, no peace, marriages are falling apart. How many more do we need to read about or hear about till we discovered God put a void in our heart that only could be filled by Him? I'm telling you, not 10 times better, a thousand times better. A thousand times better. And in Him there's joy, and in Him there's peace, and in Him is our sufficiency. What do you need? God is. He is the great I Am. Stop looking for it in popularity, possessions, prestige. Man, if I just get a boyfriend, if I could just get married, if we get, just, there's always going to be something else. Your sufficiency is found in the person of Jesus Christ. And I came to church to let you know, if you refuse to bow to the culture, God's got incredible things in store for you. Would you stand to your feet, put your hands together, and let's thank Him. Come on, I want you to give God your best praise right now. Put your hands together, and let's honor and glorify the King of Kings. Come on, make some noise. Praise you, God. I can't hear.